Mayhew, by W. Somerset Maugham. The lives of most men are determined by their environment. They accept the circumstances amid which fate has thrown them not only with resignation, but even with good will. They are like streetcars running contentedly on their rails, and they despise the sprightly flivver that dashes in and out of the traffic and speeds so jauntily across the open country. I respect them. They are good citizens, good husbands, and good fathers, and of course somebody has to pay the taxes. But I do not find them exciting. I am fascinated by the men. Few enough in all conscience who take life in their own hands and seem to mould it to their own liking. It may be that we have no such thing as free will, but at all events we have the illusion of it. At a crossroad, it does seem to us that we might go either to the right or to the left, and the choice once made, it is difficult to see that the whole course of the world's history obliged us to take the turning that we did. I never met a more interesting man than Mayhill. He was a lawyer in Detroit. He was an able and a successful one. By the time he was thirty-five, he had a large and a lucrative practice. He had amassed a competence, and he stood on the threshold of a distinguished career. He had an acute brain, an attractive personality, and uprightness. There was no reason why he should not become, financially or politically, a power in the land. One evening, he was sitting in his club with a group of friends, and they were perhaps a little the worse, or the better, for liquor. One of them had recently come from Italy, and he told them of a house he had seen at Capri, a house on a hill, overlooking the Bay of Naples, with a large and shady garden. He described to them the beauty of the most beautiful island of the Mediterranean. It sounds fine," said Mayhew. "Is that house for sale? Everything is for sale in Italy. Let Sam McKay will make an offer for it. What in heaven's name would you do with a house in Capri? Live in it," said Mayhew. He sent for a cable form, wrote it out, and dispatched it. In a few hours, the reply came back. The offer was accepted. Mayhew was no hypocrite, and he made no secret of the fact that he would never have done so wild a thing if it had been sober. But when he was, he did not regret it. He was neither an impulsive nor an emotional man, but a very honest and sincere one. He would never have continued from bravado in a cause that he had come to the conclusion was unwise. He made up his mind to do exactly as he had said. He did not care for wealth, and he had enough money on which to live in Italy. He thought he could do more with life than spend it on composing the trivial quarrels of unimportant people. He had no definite plan. He merely wanted to get away from a life that had given him all he had to offer. I suppose his friends thought him crazy. Some must have done all they could to dissuade him. He arranged his affairs, packed up his furniture, and started. Capri is a gaunt rock of austere outline, bathed in a deep blue sea, but its vineyards, green and smiling, give it a soft and easy grace. It is friendly, remote, and debonair. I find it strange that Mayhew should have settled on this lovely island, for I never knew a man more insensible to beauty. I do not know what he sought there: happiness, freedom, or merely leisure. I know what he found. In this place, which appeals so extravagantly to the senses, he lived a life entirely of the spirit. But the island is rich with historic associations, and over it broods always the enigmatic memory of Tiberius the emperor. From his windows, which overlooked the Bay of Naples, with the noble shape of Vesuvius changing in colour with a changing light, Mayhew saw a hundred places that recalled the Romans and the Greeks. The past began to haunt him. All that he saw for the first time, for he had never been abroad before, excited his fancy, and in his soul stirred the creative imagination. He was a man of energy. Presently, he made up his mind to write a history. For some time, he looked about for a subject, and at last decided on the second century of the Roman Empire. It was little known. 
and it seemed to him to offer problems analogous with those of our own day. He began to collect books and soon he had an immense library. His legal training had taught him to read quickly. He settled down to work. At first he had been accustomed to foregather in the evening with the painters, writers and such like who met in the little tavern near the piazza, but presently he withdrew himself, for his absorption in his studies became more pressing. He had been accustomed to bathe in that bland sea and to take long walks among the pleasant vineyards, but little by little, grudging the time, he ceased to do so. He worked harder than he had ever heard. worked in Detroit. He would start at noon and work all through the night till the whistle of the steamer that goes every morning from Capri to Naples told him that it was five o'clock and time to go to bed. His subject opened out before him, vaster and more significant, and he imagined a work that would put him forever beside the great historians of the past. As the years went by, he was to be found seldom in the haunts of men. He could be tempted to come out of his house only by a game of chess or the chance of an argument. He loved to set his brain against another's. He was widely read now, not only in history, but in philosophy and science. And he was a skilful controversialist, quick, logical, and incisive. But he had good humour and kindliness. Though he took a very human pleasure in victory, he did not exult in it to your mortification. When first he came to the island, he was a big, brawny fellow with thick black hair and a black beard, of a powerful physique. But gradually his skin became pale and waxy. He grew thin and frail. It was an odd contradiction in the most logical of men that, though a convinced and impetuous materialist, he despised the body. He looked upon it as the foul instrument which he could force to do the spirit's bidding. Neither illness nor lassitude prevented him from going on with his work. For fourteen years he toiled unremittingly. He made thousands and thousands of notes. He sorted and classified them. He had his subject at his finger and ends, and at last was ready to begin. He sat down to write. He died. The body that he, the materialist, had treated so contumeliously took his revenge on him. That vast accumulation of knowledge is lost forever. Vain was that ambition, surely not ignoble one, to set his name beside those of Gibbon and Mumson. His memory is treasured in the hearts of a few friends, fewer, alas, as the years pass on. And to the world he is unknown in death as he was in life. And yet, to me his life was a success. The pattern is good and complete. He did what he wanted. When he died, when his goal was in sight and never knew the bitterness of an end achieved. <laughs>